Uh, that brief section of Luke's gospel comes from Luke's gospel and Luke tells us at the very beginning of the gospel that he did a great deal of research. He spoke to the eyewitnesses, those who had heard and accumulated on the basis of that research what we call this gospel of Luke. And that story which has just been read is a story which the Lord Jesus told and the Lord Jesus therefore speaks with authority when he speaks about God he speaks with authority when he speaks about those whom God receives and the basis on which uh, God receives them. So I want you to keep that story open before you and I want you to bear that in mind that what I'm saying really is based on the authority, not of my authority, but on what Jesus says about the things of God, which are vitally important as we've already heard tonight. Now I'm a typical Australian male, almost. Uh, the longer I stay in England, the more I seem to be ac accumulating English friendships. That's a bit of a worry, but I still am fairly typical as an Australian. I think there's one area in which I'm atypical. I love shopping, and I especially love supermarket shopping. And I, just, I don't particularly want to buy things. I just love to wander around aimlessly and look at everything that's available there. And you've got Tesco and Sainsbury and all these. Oh, it's a treasure here in London. You've got so many to choose from. But it is my love for supermarkets which caused me to meet Irene. I used to get to our local supermarket 10 minutes before it opened back in Sydney. And Irene was always there as well. She was there to do her weekly shopping. She needed to get home with all the groceries and put them away in the kitchen by 10 o'clock in the morning so she could study the form guide and lay all her bets by midday. And so when we got to, we got to talking about all sorts of things, but from Irene's point of view, she was mainly telling me about trifectas and quinellas and daily, w, uh, daily doubles and uh, favourites and betting and the horses to back and that sort of thing. And so tonight, with all that rich experience of gambling behind me, I want to lead us through page 65 of Luke's Gospel. And we're going to do a bit of gambling. We're going to limit our bets to one pound each, and we're going to only put our pound on the favourite. Now have a look back at Luke 18, the first verse, the second verse actually, and we meet two people here. First of all, we meet... A judge, a judge, verse 2, who neither feared God nor respected man. And then in verse 3, there is a widow who doesn't seem to have much going for her at all. So we will lay our pound on the judge. He's the favourite. Come now to verse 11, and you meet a Pharisee who has it all together, and he doesn't mind telling everybody how he has it all together. And in verse 13, we meet a loathsome tax collector who cannot even lift his eyes towards God. Well, the favourite, obviously, is the Pharisee. We'll take our pound and we'll put it on the Pharisee to win. Verse 15. Uh, there are the time-constrained disciples of Jesus and the little kids who have nothing going for them whatsoever, and so we will put our pound on the disciples of Jesus. Verse 18, there's a rich ruler. He's got everything going for him. Uh, he's kept even the most difficult of the commandments. He's kept them all since he was a boy, so he's got no worries. He is a hot favourite. We'll put a pound on him to win. Verse 35, we meet a blind beggar who wants Jesus' attention. He hasn't got much going for him because he's surrounded by a crowd who seem determined to keep him unnoticed. So we'll put our pound on the crowd. And then when we get into the next chapter, chapter 19, we meet Zacchaeus and he is a chief tax collector. So the crowd seems to be holding him back and he's got no hope because he's a short man, we are told, and we will put our pound, therefore, on the crowd. So notice, we've put our money on the judge, we've put our money on the Pharisee, on the disciples, on the ruler, and the crowd on each occasion, and we've spent six pounds. We say it's not much, but you've done your money every time. Because those who've got everything going for them, like the judge and the Pharisee and the ruler, leave empty. But those who have nothing going for them, like the tax collector, and the children and the beggar and Zacchaeus are blessed of God. And you say, well, what is happening here? The favourites turned upside down. Grace is in operation. In actual fact, it's called amazing grace because it is so amazing because it gives contrary to our deserving. It turns the favourite upside down. 
Now, there's a difference. Tonight, you've heard the words mercy and you've heard the word grace. The word mercy is whereby God, God withholds the punishment which is rightly due to us. That's mercy. He withholds punishment. Grace, however, God bestows favour which is contrary to our deserving. Uh, when we went into our first parish ministry, uh, which was in the country of our state of New South Wales, one morning we were all in bed. It was three o'clock in the morning and uh, I was stirred because I could hear that there was movement in the back kitchen dining area of the house. I got up, I noticed that all the children were in bed. I went out, I could see the light was on in the back room uh, and the oven was on the alarm system. Someone had been carving cheese up on the dining room table. I kept going through the house, I felt like Goldilocks. I came to a door, I saw that under the door there was a light and there was movement uh, that I could see in the room, but the back room of the house had someone in it and I didn't know who it was. My heart was in my mouth. I opened the door. I sprang it open and there's a man. He looked at me. I said, what are you doing in my house? He said, oh, I'm in the wrong house, am I, father? He knew who I was. I said, you certainly are and I'm going to ring the police and get them around to take you away. Oh, please don't do that, father. Please don't do that. And I thought, right, I said, right, well, I won't do that, but you're going to have to leave. Oh, thanks very much, Father, he said. I was prepared to be merciful and withhold the punishment due. Thanks very much, Father, he said. Thanks very much. Before I go, you wouldn't have $10 on you, would you? <laughs> now, at that point, he's asking me to be gracious. He's asking me to reward him for breaking into my home. I was prepared to be merciful and withhold punishment, but I was not prepared to be gracious. Now, have a look. All those who think they can earn God's favour, that God owes them, I'm the Pharisee and God owns, owes me. I've kept all the law, God owes me. Go away empty. But those who know that they have nothing going for them, God meets them. See, this is the God, remember, who created the universe out of nothing. And look at what he says there in verse 14. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. God made the universe out of nothing. If you make yourself nothing, he specializes in making you something. Now look at the context, verse nine. Who's listening to this parable? People who trusted in themselves, verse nine of Luke 18, that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. They were superior and they looked down on everyone else. And Jesus says, let me tell you a story. It concerns two men, each are at private prayer. That's where we really know what we believe. If I could come home with you when you're quite alone and saying your private prayers and listen to what you're saying, that's where you're praying what you really believe. You're telling me what your creed is. Verse 11 and 12, here's a Pharisee. He stands up in public. He stands tall. He prays to himself about himself. Look at the dominance of I. I thank you. I am not like other men. I fast. I give a tithe of all I get. And notice that the haven of the self-righteous is always comparison. You can always find people who are worse than you. I thank you, he says, that I am not like other men. I'm not a robber. I'm not an evildoer. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer. And just out of the corner of his eye, he catches a glimpse of this little tax collector. And even like this tax collector, he says, I thank you, I'm not like that. He is a perfect picture of the people described in verse 9 who treat others with contempt because they are so sure of their own righteousness. Now, I don't know how it is with you, but I know how it is with me, that two things bring back to memory past events more than anything. One, when I hear music from past decades, I remember where I was when I was hearing that sort of music. But the other thing which makes memories vivid for me is smell. And if you smell here, what are you smelling on this man? You are smelling something that's sour. It's grace gone sour and it's a seedy smell. You see, here is a Pharisee who knows God. Here is a Pharisee who knows what God has said. God has said he esteems the humble and contrite, but this man has forgotten all that. He's forgotten that it's all about grace. He's right with God because he's deserved it. 
He's right with God because he's a good fellow. He is self-reliant. And you smell this bloke and the body odor is grace gone sour. It is smug. It is self-righteous. It is superior. And it looks down its nose at everybody else. And it stinks. It's like a ratings agency for righteousness. And this man has awarded himself triple A plus. He's a righteous man. But Jesus says there's another prayer that day. Look at him in verse 13. He sees himself only in relationship to God and he doesn't have much to say. Look at his body language. He stands at a distance. He doesn't even look up to heaven, but he beats his breast with conviction and he simply prays, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Because he knew that without mercy, which withheld the punishment due to him, then he had nothing going for him. He had nothing going for him, this man, except that he knew that he had nothing going for him. And I put it to you, friends, that if verse 14 doesn't shock you, well, you've become too used to this story. Jesus says, I tell you, this man, this tax collector, went down to his house justified before God, right in relationship with God. That's what justif justified means. This man went to, went to his home right with God and the other one didn't. The Pharisee didn't. The tax collector did, not the Pharisee. The tax collector went home justified, righteous before God. And our knee-jerk reaction to that is, well, the Pharisee is bad and the tax collectors are good. Each man got what they deserved. No way. If one of our daughters brought the Pharisee home one night on a date and the tax collector on another date, I would say to our daughter, never bring this tax collector back to our home. That Pharisee, a good, moral, up-living uh, person, a citizen, he, he can come any time. In the first century, tax collectors were loathed. They were traitors. They were Jews who worked for the occupying Romans. And they treated their own. They levied much more tax than was legal. And they were heartless. If you didn't pay, they could just sell you into slavery. The rough equivalence today is drug pushers in children's playgrounds. Outcasts. That's repulsive. Put him away, lock him up. In the archaeological record, there is only one evidence of a memorial to a tax collector in one town. This is in the whole archaeological record. It was such a rare thing that this town had an honest tax collector, a compassionate tax collector, that they erected a monument to him. But he was the vast exception. We are right to be shocked that such a mongrel should go home right with God. It is a scandal. He had nothing going for him, but he is declared in the right with God, not because of his record, but despite of his record. That's why he couldn't look up. He knew that he needed mercy. He knew that he was as guilty as anyone. Grace is operative. Grace rewards the undeserving. And Jesus says, this man who gives a heart cry to God for mercy God be merciful to me, the sinner, will go home right with God. But the other one, who didn't need mercy, he had enough going for him, he was right, thank you, will simply go home. Well, how is it for you? I'll tell you how it is for me. I was converted in 1967. 45 years I've been a Christian, that's not bad, is it? I'm an ordained minister in the church, that's pretty good, isn't it? I think I'm a good man. I'm not an evildoer like other people I know. Um, I don't go to the races generally. I don't do things that I notice that other people do. I'm a fairly good man. I hope God appreciates me. Wait on. Whew. There's an odour there. It's the odour of sour grace. Now, I support a football team, a rugby league team in Sydney. It's called the Sydney City Roosters. And their arch enemy are the South Sydney Rabbitohs. And one time Maxine and I went to watch the Roosters play the Rabbitohs. And a few rows down in front of us, there was a man who was drinking beer. He had a cigarette out of his mouth. He had a foul tongue. When women walked past, he sort of leered at them. And he was a Rabbitohs supporter. And I felt totally superior to him. Oh, God. I thank you that I'm not like that man. Look at verse 9. 
They were righteous and they treated others with contempt. I listened to both of these men and one is praying my prayer. One is praying about his achievements. One is making comparisons. One is simply saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. God has a nose for sour grace because it reminds him of the day they hung his son on the cross and the stench of sour grace filled the air that day when people were earning God's favour by crucifying his son. For everyone, look at it friends, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. I have no right to be morally superior to anyone or to look down on anyone. You come tonight thinking that either Christianity is about earning, achievement, winning and keeping God's favour by being good, but you cannot be good enough, or Christianity is about undeserved gift and grace and mercy and not having any confidence in yourself. You come tonight thinking that Christianity is about what you must do or it is simply trusting what God has done. God did not send the Lord Jesus into the world unnecessarily. He sent Jesus into the world because he knew we couldn't make it to him on our own. And because of that, he sent Jesus into the world necessarily. Now, this is a remarkable truth. Let it sink in. If you get home tonight and try to brush your hair with your other than used hand, or you blokes, if you're tying a tie, try and tie it backwards. Do things by reverse. Brush your teeth with your left hand if you're right-handed. Try that. It's very hard to do. And here is a kingdom of reversals, which is very hard for us to, to comprehend. God hates dishonesty. God hates adultery. God hates the cheat. But he justifies the dishonest. He justifies the evildoer. He justifies the cheat. When that person comes to see that they have nothing going for them and simply say, God be merciful to me, the sinner. Isn't that remarkable? I sat down with one of our granddaughters and we had magnets and we put the magnets pole on pole, same pole to same pole, and we tried to drive them to one another and they would not. We switched one around and they, she could not keep them apart. And God tells us absolutely clearly that he is repelled by human pride and self-righteousness, but he is attracted by humility, which cries out for mercy to God. Did this tax collector go home back to his old cheating life? He is righteous in the sight of God. Of course he didn't. That will inevitably show itself in a changed lifestyle. But the changed lifestyle doesn't make him right with God. If you come tonight to cast yourself on the mercy of God and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, there will be change in your life. But that change in your life doesn't make you right with God. God makes you right with God. God will accept you and he will make you his. I want you to know that here are two men. They go to the same temple. They are, both, they are both theists. They both pray to God. They are both believers. But only one goes home justified. One catalogues his goodness and exalts himself. The other has little to say except to cast himself on God's mercy. And here, friends, is the principle of the story. The only thing which I have going for me is that I know that I have nothing going for me except the grace and mercy of God. Do you know that? Or have you developed a confidence in yourself? Will you tonight admit that to God? These are the words of Jesus. He knows what he's talking about. He's talking about his heavenly father. And he's saying, you need to recognize this major breakthrough, that you are a sinner in need of mercy. And the only way to deal with that is to cast yourself on God. The widow had nothing going for her. The children couldn't commend themselves. The beggar, nothing. Zacchaeus, a chief tax collector, this tax collector, had nothing going for him. The rich young ruler and the Pharisee, awfully good on paper. But ultimately, nothing going for them. There's a famous hymn that says, Nothing in my hand I bring, Simply to your cross I cling. Naked look to you for dress. Helpless look to you for grace. 
Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me saviour, or I die. Whatever your spiritual CV looks like tonight is totally irrelevant. Whether you've been moral, immoral, totally irrelevant. Because we all come on a level playing field. Leave the degrees behind. Leave the accomplishments behind. God is a God of mercy. You come to him and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. A friend of mine was the principal of a Bible school in Asia. One night at about 10 o'clock at night within the Bible college compound, there was a knock on his door. When he opened the door, he saw one of his students. The student was standing there with the limp body of the student's little five-year-old daughter. The man said to the principal, my daughter is ill. I have no medicine. I have no money. I have no transport to get her to the hospital. Will you help? That's the spirit in which we are to come to God. I have nothing to commend myself. I have nothing to justify why I have lived the way I've lived. I simply lay myself out before you in all my spiritual poverty and ask you to be merciful to me, a sinner, and that is highly regarded by God. Will you humble yourself tonight? Because when you do, God will lift you up. And Jesus, who speaks most authoritatively, says, without any prerequisites, knowing you've got nothing going for you, when you pray that simple prayer from your heart, God be merciful to me, the sinner, that you will go home right with God, eternally right with God, or tonight, you will simply go home. And that's tragic. I remember when my parents sent me to Sunday school, I was about seven years of age and life seemed so easy and simple. But one area of life seemed to be very complex and that was becoming and being a Christian. It was all about reading your Bible, going to church, saying your prayers. It seemed very complex. Now I'm older, I realise that life is more complex than I thought, but being a Christian, becoming and being a Christian is much simpler than I thought. It's as simple as saying to God in the integrity of your own heart, I'm sorry, thank you, please. I'm sorry that I've ignored you and lived life my own way. Thank you for sending Jesus to be the way back to you. Please have mercy on me and forgive me and make me right with you. Will you do that tonight? Here is an opportunity. There is no accident that you are here to hear this clear story of our Lord Jesus. And it's a challenge to you. But it's a wonderfully liberating challenge, isn't it? Because it doesn't mean you have to be good enough for anyone. You simply have to lay yourself before God and say, I'm not good enough. But thank you that you're merciful. God be merciful to me, a sinner. Sorry. Thank you. Please. You might like to respond to this tonight. If you look over on the back of your sheet, there are the Christianity Explored classes. You might, yes, say, yes, I want to know more about this because this is so different to anything I ever expected Christianity to be about. I thought it was about being good and being moral and earning my way to heaven, earning brownie points. But Christianity Explored will help you with that and you won't be embarrassed and you'll be able to come along and listen uh, to the truth of what Jesus is saying here. At the end of the meeting tonight, I'm going to pray. There'll be a few of us standing around the front here, and Andrew from Christian Explored will be down here too. We want you to come down if you want to know more. Come down and talk to us about this, because these are very weighty issues, and this is the biggest breakthrough you will ever make as you seek to live your life before God. Well, let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that the Lord Jesus taught simply and clearly about how we can be right with you. We thank you that it is not a matter of achievement. It is not a matter of anything that we can take pride in. But it is simply us laying ourselves before you. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Father, keep reminding us the only thing we have going for us is that we know we have nothing going for us apart from the grace and mercy of God. 
We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.